Hello friends, today I want to share some sto a story about the life of Laura Ingalls Wilder. She was one of my favorite authors growing up and she continues to be an author that inspires me. We share a lot of sh history since I was from Wisconsin. I grew up not very far from where the little house in the big woods was located. And like Laura's family, my family were uh, pioneers that traveled into the prairie. And so reading her stories helped me connect to my relatives and their journey westward ho, uh, discovering parts of the new world that would become states in our United States of America. So her stories are endlessly entertaining to me and inspirational and a reminder uh, to be thankful for all the gifts of Mother Earth and for connecting through sharing these fun times with family and friends and living a simple life that adds so much enjoyment and appreciation to the gifts of Mother Earth. So I'm going to share this little biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder and then I'm going to show you a few things that I collected when I was a kid up, uh, at museums that I visited about her life. This book is written and illustrated by Alexandra Walner. And see how she's sitting at her desk writing the stories from her life. I, and I, I thought it was so amazing to find out that she wrote her first book in her 60s. So that gives me a lot of inspiration to write stories since we're, I'm getting into that age myself. <laughs> And it says, in the spirit of those, to the spirit of those who have the courage to follow their dreams, that was a dedication by the author. Laura Elizabeth Ingalls was born on February 7, 1867, near Pepin, Wisconsin, to Caroline and Charles Ingalls. Her sister Mary was two years older. The family lived in a log cabin in the big woods. Wolves, bears, panthers, and foxes lived in the woods too. But Mary, Laura and Mary felt safe with Ma and Pa. In the evenings they sat by the cozy fire. Ma read to them, Pa sang, and played jolly tunes on his fiddle to make everyone laugh. Ma raised vegetables, cooked, served and kept sewed and kept house. Pa hunted game and grew crops for food. Often Pa spoke about growing, owning land where plowing would be easier. He dreamed of farming on the prairie. So we can see a little picture from inside their home and they hang f flowers and plants from the ceiling to dry so they can use them later and through the winter. In 1868, Pa sold the farm. The Ingalls packed their belongings in a covered wagon and headed west. They say westward ho. They traded for me they traveled for many months. During the long journey, Laura listened to Pa tell stories by the campfire. So here they see that wagon that had all of their possessions in there and they would travel and they would often have to sleep on the ground uh, along the way. It's like camping, isn't it? It was a hard journey, and it's one that my family did as well. When they came to Kansas at last, Laura saw land that looked like a sea of grass. Remember, the prairie is a savanna, a grassland and it's a very important grassland in our country. Just grass and flowers as far as the eye can see. It's like ocean of grass. Pa built a cabin in 1870. Laura's sister Carrie was born there. Unknown to Pa, the cabin was an Osage Indian land and the 
Indians were angry. At night, Laura heard war cries and frightened her more than wolves howling. People didn't understand about the new world and the people had, who had lived there for generations and generations before they came. So there were misunderstandings and people had to find a way to work out problems peacefully. Pa had no claim to the land and the family moved back to Wisconsin, but Pa missed the prairie. And in 1874, they moved near Walnut Grove, Minnesota. Pa bought a dugout house made of sod and willow branches. Laura thought the house was strange, but Ma said it would be snug. So this is a kind of house that is built into a, a hillside. The sod is like grass and you live inside and they cut out a window and a door. It's like animals do. It's actually warmer underground uh, in the winter and it's cooler in the summer. But it is very unusual if you haven't lived that way before. I've had people who lived in sod homes and it was, they enjoyed it, but it was very rustic. Mary helped Ma with chores and baby Carrie. Laura played on the prairie and fished nearby in Plum Creek. When a school was started in town, Laura was afraid she couldn't play anymore. Soon she discovered she liked school, especially reading and writing. Pa expected to make a lot of money from his wheat crop, so he built a real house. See all the wheat fields that he had planted? He, it had yellow pine boards, glass windows, and china doorknobs. Laura had never seen such a fine house. It's very different from the sod house built into the hill. But during the summer, grasshoppers invaded the prairie and ate the wheat. This happened oftentimes. Those grasshoppers were pests and they would come in large groups and eat everything in sight. And so all Pa's hard work raising that crop was lost every bit of it. And this happened to many of our ancestors that tried to settle in the prairie only to have this happen. Swarms of grasshoppers or locusts coming and eating all their crops. It's a very hard thing. The next summer the grasshoppers came again. Pa had no wheat to sell. The family had to leave the fine house. Look at the grasshoppers cover everything. They're trying to find things to eat. They eat everything in sight. And of course, that they ate their food too. It was a very hard time. More trouble followed. Laura's baby brother, Freddie, died soon after he was born. Because Pa couldn't find work, the family had to move many times. Everyone was sad, but when Pa played the, his fiddle in the evenings, his sweet melodies comforted them. They were also cheered by the birth of Laura's sister Grace in 1877. Then the family moved back to Walnut Grove where Pa worked at odd jobs. So it was a very, very challenging life. They had to move a lot in order to make a living, have enough food to eat and to have money to build a home. One winter Mary caught a fever and lost her eyesight. From then on Laura became Mary's eyes. When they walked on the prairie Laura described the changing seasons, the sunsets, and everything she saw to Mary. Laura was learning to make pictures with words. That's the gift of language. In 1879, Pa found a job in Silver Lake, Dakota Territory. That's before it was a state. Working in a store for a railroad. When the railroad construction camp closed for the winter, he became its watchman. The family lived in the surveyor's house. 
During the long winter nights, Pa told stories. Laura never tired of Pa's wonderful stories. Laura read aloud from books and newspapers, always saving part of the story for the next night. Everyone wanted to know what happened next. It's like a cliffhanger, isn't it? In the spring, the Ingalls moved to Desmet, a new town in the Dakota Territory. Pa no longer dreamed of farming on the prairie, and he promised Ma they could, would not have to move again. Laura was happy living near school. Even so, school was often closed because of deep snow, and Laura studied at home. She read her family's books over and over and borrowed others. She wrote poems in little books she made herself. In the winter of 1880, blizzard after blizzard swept across the prairie. The town was running out of food. Two young men, Almanzo Wildler and Cap Garland, made a dangerous trip in sleighs across the frozen prairie to get wheat from a farmer who had a big supply. They kept the town's folks from starving. Laura thought Almanzo was the real hero. Because she was a good student, Laura was asked to teach at a prairie school. She was lonely away from her family. One Friday, Almanzo surprised her by coming in a sleigh to take her home. On Friday, Almanzo, uh, then she stayed with her family all weekend. Then Almanzo took her back on Sunday. He did the same every weekend so that she wouldn't be lonely all the way teaching school at the one room schoolhouse. Laura taught at two more prairie schools, but like most frontier girls, she did not graduate from high school. She loved Almanzo, who she called Manly, and married him in 1885. So back then, People would teach if they could, had good reading and writing skills. They didn't necessarily even go to college to get a degree like our teachers do now. A year later, their daughter was born. Laura named her Rose after the bright pink flowers that bloomed on the prairie. Laura and Manley were happy. Soon, though, the Wilders suffered hard times. Hail, drought, and fierce windstorms ruined their wheat crops and made them poor. Their baby son died soon after he was born. A serious illness left Manly weak. To help him recover, Laura and Manly moved to Minnesota with his family, then to Florida, where it was warm. They returned to Desmet, but life on the prairie was too harsh. In 1894, they decided to try farming in the milder climate of the Ozark Mountains. They traveled to Missouri where they found lush fields and tree-covered mountains. Laura kept a notebook about the journey. A week before reaching Mansfield, Missouri, she sent a letter describing her trip to a newspaper in Desmet. It was published and Laura proudly wrote in the margin, first I ever had published. Think how excited she was. With a hundred dollars Laura had earned from sewing, she and Manley made a down payment on land near Mansfield that she, they called Rocky Ridge Farm. In the gentler climate of the Ozarks, Laura raised chickens and grew fruit trees, and soon the farm prospered. Laura would not move again. That was her happy home. Once the farm was well established, Laura decided to share her knowledge about farming. In 1911, she started writing articles for a paper, the Missouri Ruralist, and soon had a column called As a Farm Woman Thinks. A few years later, Rose, who was now a well-known writer, urged her mother to write for a national magazine. Laura took her advice and did. But Laura had wanted to do more than that. She wanted to write about her life as a pioneer girl. Her memories and Pa's stories were too good to be altogether lost. She wanted to do some writing that will count. 
She wrote and revised a story called Pioneer Girl many times. Finally, a book company wanted to publish it if she rewrote it for children, and she did. In 1932, when Laura was 65, her first book, Little House in the Big Woods, was published. Readers loved it. They wanted to know what happened next. Laura wrote seven more books about her family. She was pleased that so many people enjoyed her stories. Laura was as good at writing stories as Pa had been at telling them. In 1949, Manley died at the age of 92. He had a good long life. Although Laura was lonely without him, she kept busy answering fan letters and seeing visitors. Reflecting about her hard but rewarding life, she wrote, It is still best to be honest and truthful, to make the most of what we have, to be happy with simple pleasures, and to be cheerful and have courage when things go bad. Laura died on February 10th. 1957, three days after her 90th birthday. Laura once said that she had written her stories because I wanted the children to understand more about the beginning of things, to know what, it, what is behind the things they see, and it is that made America as they know it. And here's an author's note. The Little House books were Little House in the Big Woods, Farmer Boy, Little House on the Prairie, On the Banks of Plum Creek, By the Shores of Silver Lake, The Long Winter, Little Town on the Prairie, The Happy Gold, These Happy Golden Years, and The first, first Four Years. Laura wrote eight Little House books. The ninth book, The First Four Years, was published in 1971 from notes Laura had kept. The books have been published in more than 40 different languages. Books marked with uh, have, been, have been nominated for Newbery Honor books. In 1954, the American Library Association created the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award to honor an author or illustrator whose books have made a substantial and lasting contribution to literature for children, Laura received the first award. And she was, when I was a little girl like your age, I used to check her books out every week in my school library. And later I had them in my own collection and I read them over and over again. And I still collect things because she's an inspiration to me. I visited a museum about her life and I bought these postcards one time and this is a picture of her when she was young. This is a picture of Carrie, Mary, and Laura. And you can see them in their best dresses posing for a family picture, the three sisters, a different kind of three sisters. Here we have a picture, a wedding picture of Ma and Pa. That's what Ma and Pa looked like in their special portrait. Here's a picture of Laura Ingalls Wilder in 1935 when she was an author. How exciting she was. Here is a picture of the Little House Wayside. I'm from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is very close to Pepin, Wisconsin. And we went and visited this uh, special little uh, honor to Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, because it's, it's where the little house in the big woods was located, very close to where I grew up. Here's a picture of Laura and Almanzo. That's what they looked like together. A very happy, loving couple. Here's the Charles Ingalls family. That's Pa's family. And here is a picture of Laura Ingalls Wilder when she was young. Isn't it fun to be able to visit 
our favorite authors and see little things, memories of the lives they lived. We can do that too using scrapbooks, taking pictures, writing down in our journal, things that happened in our lives so that we can share them with family and friends later and who knows, maybe someday you'll write a story about your life and all of your adventures. I, as I said, I've been collecting her books and I even have a little house cookbook which has some of her favorite recipes. And as I've said many times, corn and cornbread is one of those foods that was such an important part of colonial and pioneer life. And I don't know about you, but I still love it today. Cornbread with honey or maple syrup, you can't go wrong. There's all of these recipes using that very important uh, ingredient corn and beans and here she's got huckleberry pie made with huckleberries that grew in her in her farm different things using the gifts of mother earth there's little drawings of when they would uh, harvest the wheat and use that wheat grind it down to make things like uh, dumplings and biscuits and bread she has her own recipes in here. Different favorite recipes. It's, fun. it's really fun to uh, try recipes from the past. It's fun to learn where food comes from. You know, we have this rich availability of food because people have been sharing seeds from all over the world. And we have a little a picture of what life was like in the pioneer times and in the colonial times because Laura Ingalls Wilder and other people that lived in those early times wrote those recipes down and shared them with us so that we can still enjoy them today. I also have a little book scrapbook about her life and it's really fun to go through and see pictures and little stories and games they would play. Here's some of those same pictures. See the travels she took. Picture of Pa's fiddle. What the little house looked like. How it was arranged. And in her stories we read about how she slept in a trundle bed with Mary. A trundle bed is a bed where a part of a bed is underneath and you pull it out uh, to sleep in. So you'd have mom and dad sleeping up above and then the trundle it would be the children because you didn't have a lot of space so you had to make the most of the space available. Here we see things that would have been in their kitchens like a coffee grinder, kerosene lamps, candy in jars, so many things. Here we see them making candy they pour it on the snow to harden it up. So I'm gonna be reading some little story books, just some short picture books with some of the stories that were in the eight Laura Ingalls Wilder stories so that you can have a little snapshot of different scenes that happened in their lives and imagine yourself living in those times, what life was like reading stories like this at school, The Legends of the Red Children. This is a book that was from the 1800s and on the cover we see corn and that the three sisters and different stories that were passed down to tell about the world from different people's perspectives. This would have been a little children's book from those early times that they used to learn to read in school. It's the F-U-N book. Fun, fun, fun.